about that. So with that being said, um, I want to do a quick inter introduction other than myself of the city staff that is here. Believe it or not, it's the city staff got here at six this morning and worked all day and uh, want to come to this meeting all night. I know a lot of the staff will be at, going to do back to back with a city council meeting tomorrow as well. So real proud of the effort that our staff puts in to put in these 14, 16 hour days. So I'm going to start it off with Rob and go around the room just so you know who your city staff is. Hi, everybody. Um, echo what Jake says. Uh, welcome for being here. Um, I appreciate you taking the time and, and really coming and having this conversation with us. I'm Rob Andy High, Deputy City Manager and also Director of Information Systems. Yes, I have two titles, just like Jake, and <laughs> I fell for it too. But um, but uh, joking aside, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to do the work I, I'm doing and, and just real proud of what the city does on a daily basis. And so anything I can do to contribute, I'm always happy to do that. So. Pass it off to Joe. So my name is Joe Gillard. I'm the director of Public Works. I only have one title in my name. <laughs> so um, we're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I appreciate you guys being here. I appreciate the engagement. Um, I kind of run the day-to-day -day operations of what the city is doing um, with, with homelessness. I oversee the quality of life group, and um, I will explain it a little bit more in depth in a minute. But um, Welcome everybody, and thanks for coming. Okay, we've got the new guy. So, uh, just want to take a second to introduce myself, uh, Sean McGlynn. I'm the new city manager for the city of Escondido, um, and just thank you for coming out and participating, and looking forward to getting to know everybody over the next uh, year or so. So, thank you. And uh, we've also got two of our city council members with us. We've got Mayor Paul McNamara and we've got Tina Insko, city council member. Good to have you guys here. Thank you so much for being here. And I'd be remiss to forget the, the glue of this entire organization, our folks in the back. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're afraid you're getting another job. <laughs> I need more titles. Um, I mean, I work in information systems. So. Carlin McAuley, I work in information systems. Awesome to have you guys here. Thank you guys. So now that we know who everyone is from a staff point of view, we're going to start to get to know you guys. But before we do, I just want to make sure I do a quick uh, introduction of why we're here. What's this all about? What are we What are we up to here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Very good. Bonus points for you. We are here for the homelessness. Awesome job. Okay, I, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Very good. A good segue to homelessness was one of the five major community advisory groups that we formed about two years ago. We wanted to engage the community around some very important things in the city. So we asked if you were interested in arts and culture, you could sign up for that advisory group. There was another one for recreational and uh, youth activities. We had an economic development group, we had a climate action group, and we had a homelessness and housing group that all got together. I'm proud to say that um, this, this uh, CAG is still going very strong, as you can see by the participation in the room, and I'll talk about why we are trying to engage with more people. Uh, we also um, started out this, this kind of grassroots effort by, we challenged residents to come in and, and bring their one big idea so if you could solve homelessness, what would be your one big idea? And we went around the room and we kind of made idea groups on what was feasible, what wasn't, what required more money, and it kind of boiled down to really two different groups. And uh, then COVID hit. And we got a lot of feedback from the community that um, they wanted to broaden it out a little more, talk more about the larger issue than distilling down all of these big ideas to two that were really feasible. So we talked a lot, we, we kind of rebranded it and wanted to engage a, a broader audience, more of our community members to come out. And I'm glad to see this work, to see a lot of new faces and a couple of the uh, familiar faces from the first community advisory groups that we had a series of three to four meetings with. So that brings us to why we're here today. We're here to talk about um, uh, something near and dear to my heart, and I'm sure to your ears, the, the homelessness and how as a city we can um, do outreach and have uh, more discussion around what we're doing as a city and what we can do as community members around this topic. So uh, I, I know we hear a lot of things and we want to bring some data and, and Rob and his team has done a really good job, but we hear, we hear the city's not doing anything. 
Uh, we hear it's homelessness is getting worse. It's it's, it's running rampant, and it's it's kind of a buzz of blanket topics that you hear. But what you're going to see tonight is we're going to try and put some data to that and uh, explain uh, where we're kind of at the state of homelessness in our city so far today. And really, what what we want to do is provide uh, a forum for our community members to have a voice, to be able to say what's on your mind, what's important to you, is it affecting your business, is it affecting you where you live? And we hope to grab some of these comments and feedback and bring it to our policy members and see what we where we want to go as it relates to homelessness. So um, does it sound like we're all in the right place? All right, I see a lot of heads nodding. I think at this point in time, to keep the, the meeting moving, I want to bring up Rob. And Rob's going to talk a little bit about where we're at right now and what we're doing. So Rob, I'm going to throw it over to you. Thank you, Jake. Um, so my biggest goal tonight is really to start the conversation about information. And that was what the driving factor of creating our website is really just to be informative, to get the word out, what's going on, what's the city efforts, um, our, talk about our service providers, whether you're being impacted because from a business standpoint or a resident um, about the homeless activity in, in our community, or if you want to get involved and see how you can help our service providers or, or help someone who's experiencing homelessness. Um, whatever, you, whatever brings you here today for this conversation, it starts with being informed. And so we're gonna kind of go through our website a little bit. Um, I know you can read this at home and you can and hopefully you pass this on to your neighbors and, and other people in the community and really tell them this is a great place to start to get informed of what's happening on the homeless conversation. But I also really wanted to kind of drive home a few points, which is what is the city doing in this area? Um, you know, we have a role that, that we play in this conversation, but there's things that we do not do. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. And that's where our service providers come in into that conversation. So I'll touch briefly on this stuff. There's a lot of information on this website. It's, it's designed to kind of be laid out in that kind of a format of kind of, depending on who you are and what part of the conversation you want to, that you're interested in, you want to be more informed on, you can kind of break it, you know, it gets broken down within the website. So at the end of this conversation, we will dive into a little bit more. Joe will come up and, and talk more about specifically the city's role and what the city is specifically doing. Um, and at the end, we'll kind of wrap it up and we really want to hear from you at that point of what brings you here. What, what part of the conversation are we missing? What do we need to be more aware about? Because um, you're our ears and, and eyes out there in the community and you know what's going on. Um, you know, posting stuff on social media, well, that's, that's fine, that's great, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a great vehicle to communicate with us in the city. So coming here is really a great start to open that conversation and open that dialogue up. And we really want to hear from you because we really want to address this problem as much as we possibly can. There's lots of reasons why you know we have homeless um, out there and why we maybe wait. we can't maybe address a certain issue, but that's part about being informed, right? So we'll briefly talk about some of this stuff and then we'll kind of go from there. So. On the, on the main page here, when you first hit our site, we, we talk about some of the big topics, right? Define a little bit about homelessness, talk about the city's mission, and then we, we really wanna jump in right away. If, if you're coming here because you wanna look for a phone number, because you wanna you know, help somebody get services, the two on one, or if you're having an emergency situation, we wanna remind you to call 911. So right away, we wanna talk about that particular topic right up front. And then as we go down through here, we have our quick links because we find like this is, you know, a lot of people come for different reasons, right? Who are our partners, our business owners that are being impacted in some way, um, our residents are being impacted in some way. So they're coming and trying to find some more information. We have our CAG, that's this tonight. And how can I help, right? So if you wanna just get involved and you wanna help in some way, you know, we have that link there. And then right away, we, we start to move on to some data. What, what is homelessness? What does that look like in our city? Um, there's no perfect way of, of doing these counts, but this is a count that we have out there that we kind of use as a, as a benchmark, and we kind of go from there. And this is an interactive piece as you scroll down a little bit here. Um, we have homelessness here. You can see how it's impacting other cities in the North County. We start this, but it's an interactive map. You can move that map around, and you can see what's going on in the rest of the county. Um, you can move it around, see the different numbers. And again, these numbers are debatable. Depending on who you talk to, they'll debate these numbers. 
and that sort of thing. But that's not the point. The point is to really kind of get an overview of what's what, what's really going on. Um, and so, if you scroll down, this we have a strategic document. It's it's meant to be a guiding line of what the city is doing and how we're approaching um, homelessness. And at the very bottom here on the page, we really we really want to hear from you on a regular basis. If you're experiencing some problems, we have a reported app. If you don't have this app already in your phone, I highly encourage you to get it. It's a great way to communicate with us. It's not a 911 function. It's just a way of saying, I see an encampment over here. I see some debris over here. Um, it's a way to put that on a map and report it to us so we get those into public works as service requests, or we pass along to maybe code compliance um, officer. And so it's a way for us to kind of address issues that you see that we're not everywhere all the time. So we really need some help, and that's where your engagement really kind of comes into play. Um, so then if, if we move along on the, on the site, um, our challenge, this page is our really kind of a brief attempt at trying to define some of our homeless issues. Um, it's really a complex issue. So as you see, people are experiencing homeless out throughout the community. Um, you wanna be really careful not to label everybody. You know, everyone is, is experiencing different reasons. There's different reasons why they're on the streets. Um, and so we have to have different approaches. And so we try to lay this out on this page. We talked about the, you know, defining homelessness, the subpopulations, the different groups. It, this is not an exhaustive. There's, there's, you could have a whole bunch of other groups in here, but this, we wanted to kind of give a basic kind of definition of what's going on here. Um, just go down some more. It just, it's, the site is laid out to give you a bunch of information to get you started in the conversation, to get you informed. Um, and then that might lead to you to do another you know, web searches to go down a rabbit hole and really find some more defining information. Um, the effects of legislation is also a really important part of the conversation. You know, why aren't you doing something about this individual? They're doing this and they're doing that. There's a lot of legislation out there that, that restricts us and what we can and cannot do. And a lot of people are not aware of that. And so it's a, an important piece to really kind of read on and really kind of understand. Um, why isn't the police doing this? Why aren't they taking care of that? And we get a lot of calls for service and we do we do come out and we do address the situation the best we can but there's some things that we just cannot do so we try to try to inform you there um talk a little bit about covid and and, and uh and homelessness um just keep scrolling down a little bit about housing some more there's a lot of information here we wanted to kind of put out there to kind of get get that conversation started try to start to inform you um we go over to funding. So this is an important piece because while we use city budget to do stuff like the quality of life team, um, you have our public safety responses for 911 calls and, and non-emergency calls to, into dispatch that go out there. We, we fund those types of things internally, public works department, um, code compliance, that's all city general fund dollars that, that go to address that. But there's things that the city does not do. Right? There's a lane of what the city does, and there's other things that, that are needed, and we don't do those things, right? And so we need help, and that's where our partnerships come into play. And so we get state and federal funding that comes to us, and then we allocate that out to service providers, um, individuals, uh, organizations like, like Interfaith, you know, breaks here with Interfaith, and, and um, we really rely on them to take care of those professional services that the city just doesn't do. And so this is the page that kind of walks through those types of funding sources. Um, and kind of, there's, if you scroll down through here a little bit, just give you a quick look at some of the stuff. We kind of outline some of these things here. We have some, some areas where we kind of drill down and, and explain some of the stuff. And um, it's really a, a good place to kind of look. If I get asked all the time, how much does homelessness cost the city? It's pretty hard just to put a number to something like that um, because there's a lot of different things going on. It's a really complex conversation, and sometimes you get a little bit of frustration. And in, in, in my response of saying, well, that's, "I can't just answer that. It's not an easy answer," um, but it's it's pretty impactful, and this tries to kind of paint a picture of, of that. So, if we move on to um, the partner stuff, partners and, and resources, this is an important page for a couple different reasons. First, we talk about um, business owners, the partnership that the city has with, with business owners. We try to, um, again, it's a partnership. We don't own these properties. You know, our lane is really city property and trying to address that. 
but we also realize that on, on private property, there's a point where we partner up and we try to address the issues that might be happening. But property owners really need to take responsibility for their own property. Um, we cannot go on their property and make improvements or make changes. Um, we can't add lighting if it's needed. We can't add fencing. Um, we can't, there's lots of stuff we can't do because we don't own that property. So there's a partnership there, right? <clears throat> One of the things we do is we collect data on a regular basis, whether it's from public safety um, or through um, public works. We collect a lot of information. And when we get these calls for service through our reported app or just phone calls in, we try to track all that. Where's, where is it happening within our city? So we put that on the map. And then based on that, we try to reach out to business owners in a particular group, a particular area. Um, and we try to get everyone together to have a conversation like this and talk about, hey, there's some impacts going on to you, all of your businesses. What do we do? So if just one property owner does something and the rest of them don't, it's not really going to change that area, right? And our end goal is always the same thing, is to try to encourage those who are experiencing homelessness to reach out, have that conversation, and connect with services, and to change their lives and get them off the streets. That's always our goal. And so we need to continue to have these conversations and working together, and that's what partnership's all about. And so we talked about this, and this is a, a really key thing. So if you know of any business owners, or if there's some business owners in here, we have this, we created this business homeless resource guide. Um, it's a 30 page document. It kind of walks through all of the different things that you can be doing on your property to kind of alleviate some of your issues. How do you maybe address homelessness? or people who are experiencing homelessness on your property. Um, it just kind of walks through all the signage, parking lot issues, all those types of things that you're supposed to be doing on your property. Um, and not just you, but everybody is supposed to be doing these things and working collectively, which will hopefully all lead to the same answer, which is connecting people to services, right? And changing their lives. So you see pictures like this, you see individuals like this, and this is a group of people here and um, when we find this, is, our approach is always the same. We'll get a, a reported app on something like this. We'll send somebody out and we'll talk to them about services and about connecting them to services. Um, whether it's, you know, sending, uh, maybe connecting with a, an outreach team that my you goes, goes out or whether it's public works or code compliance or someone from our cops unit to go out there and have that conversation with them. But at the end of the day, this is not public space. The, they're not, customers of these businesses, they need to move along, they can't camp out there. So um, that's what the resource guide is, is trying to help businesses and, and deal with some of these things that are having an impact with their business. So if we go back over to the site here. So as you scroll down, the next whole section in here is to talk about all the things that we partner with, with our service providers. And there's links to, to their sites, there's, um, if you want to get involved, you want to volunteer, this is a great place to start. Click on this link, go to their websites, they have volunteer opportunities. If you've never done it before, I strongly suggest you do it. Really get out there and, and kind of get involved as much as you can. Um, there's nothing more rewarding than to help someone change their life. So I strongly encourage you to do something like that. But this is a great place to start. And then you can see as we scroll down through this, there's a lot of service providers, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, that are aimed to try to help these individuals. So, and it's about partnership. This is, this, these are the things that the city does not do. So what we do is we try to help fund these activities and help, you know, help these things kind of move along and provide these services. Um, the last page we have up over here is our FAQ. It's just a quick stop, kind of a place to, um, if you have some, these are some of the basic questions that we get on a regular basis. So we wanted to put that up and have some answers to some of these things. And so they're kind of organized in, in a way if you're, you know, your business owner, um, you know, currently experiencing homelessness or not risk of being homelessness. Because there's also a big part of this conversation is, is prevention. We really want to address prevention. Um, if we can prevent you from becoming homeless, it's, it's, where we really want to be, we want to live in that area because once you become homeless, it's it's much harder to bring you back. So um, we spend a lot of effort in that area as well. Um, so with, with that, I, I want to kind of then circle back around and talk about city efforts, right? Because one of the things which is kind of interesting, you know, we have this website talks about all this stuff going on. And what we hear sometimes uh, frequently is 
city's not doing anything. And so we have this page up here, and this kind of outlines what the city is doing, what our lane is and, and our efforts um, that we're doing on a daily basis. And um, Joe will come up and, and specifically talk about the city efforts. He leads our quality of life team, which encompasses many departments, as, you, as you'll see from here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, so like Rob mentioned, you know, homelessness is a very complex issue. And um, back in 2018, uh, from guidance from the city manager's office, the quality of life group was formed here at the city of Escondido. Originally, it was formed with the COPS unit, um, code compliance, public works, and the downtown rangers. Um, quickly, that has evolved um, to, to the departments that, that you see here that, that include fire, um, housing, and, and or, oh, I can't, Environmental programs, the city attorney's office, economic development, and, and neighborhood and housing services. Had to do it last there. Um, <laughs> the, the housing kind of uh, cut me off. But um, it's, it's, it's the group of city staff that engage, you know, with, with our partners. It's the group that fund, you know, our, our partner services. Um, you know, neighborhood and neighborhood services um, works a lot with Greg's group and interface um, with the ESG home funds. Um, the public works group does a lot of cleanup around the city. We average about a hundred yards of debris a week that we pick up in the city. So imagine a 10 yard dump truck, a dump truck that drives around. We pick up about 10 of those um, in the city um, on a weekly basis. Um, we also have rangers that patrol our downtown parks and city facilities with the downtown rangers. Uh, we're very fortunate to hire um, a ranger that came from the McAllister Institute. Um, he has a lot of connections with our service providers that Rob mentioned. Um, you know, and contacts does a lot of outreach and contacts individuals um, that are homeless to our outreach providers. Our code enforcement works with our business groups, um, you know, to deal with the impacts, the adverse impacts of homelessness on private property. Environmental programs is, is instrumental on dealing with the impacts of homelessness in our waterways and our sensitive habitats. Um, our city attorney's office provides uh, legal advice to the quality of life group um, and also prosecutes for uh, misdemeanor infractions uh, on our municipal code. And then homelessness affects our economic development as well. So our economic development department, um, unfortunately, uh, that position is open right now. Hopefully it'll be soon to be filled on Monday. Thank you. And uh, so we will get our, our economic uh, development deputy director back in the quality of life group because uh, the economic development uh, works with business associations and also uh, just really the community on the adverse impacts of homelessness in the city. So as you can see, there's a lot of city services that are dedicated to deal with homelessness in Escondido. A lot of these groups are working with our service providers, like Rob mentioned, because a lot of the issues are not on city property city roadways so we have to we have to really rely on our service advisors our, our service providers and our community to all come together to tackle you know the the, the impacts of, of homelessness Thank you. yeah so on this page if we can just go down a little bit um i i, I want to stress enough that we really are kind of motivated by the evidence-based you know information right it's this data that kind of leads us to act on a daily basis. Um, some areas that we might patrol more frequently based on, on the call. So this first one is you know, calls for service to police. You can start to see through the city. And this is an interactive map. You can move it around, you can zoom, zoom in and out. So we start to look at some of this data and we say, what's really going on in the city? Um, how can we help direct some of our outreach teams and where to go? We can do that based on calls. Um, if you scroll down some more, Kind of go through some of these environments. Public works is the same type of thing. If you use a reported app and you're reporting things, these things all get mapped out. We talk about 
candidate camp reports. Um, we see some heat maps, and this is scrolling through month by month. We can start to see what's going on. We want to pass along that information to whoever needs it, and hopefully kind of provide services more efficiently, more effectively, right? Um, it also helps our, our crews where to go on in the city on a regular basis. What do we need to have cleaned up? And we really need your reporting of that to kind of, we, we don't have enough staff to drive around everywhere all the time, right? We just don't, simply don't. And so, again, through the reported app, we get this data and we can kind of tailor our routes that we might go through and, and try to address some of the issues. If you scroll down some more, we have um, the fire department. Again, it has some more data here. This is calls for service. Um, and this is, you know, these calls for service, like even this, it's just, even like the police one was just on the homeless population. This is not calls for service on everything, right? This is just um, things related to homelessness. So, um, these things really are powerful for us because we really want to do evidence-based reactions, right? We want to develop policies. We want to develop um, just how we're going to go about approaching this problem. Um, we need to have that information. So downtown park rangers, this is a map of all of our different parks. You see there's a lot of locations and we have a very minimal staff in the park rangers, but they go around to all of these different parks and they patrol these areas on a regular basis to make sure that these parks are great assets of the city that you know all of our citizens can use and enjoy on a regular basis to make sure they're nice and clean, that, that there are no problems um, at these locations. And this is an interactive map too. You can click on any one of these dots. It shows some pictures of the parks and those types of things. Um, so if we scroll down some more, we start to go through some of the rest of these um, you know, uh, departments and it kind of talks a little bit about what they're doing. So it's from the quality of life team that Joe heads up, you can really see that we're putting the city's been a lot of effort in to try to do this, but we need your help. We need partners, we need engagement, we need people like yourselves to, to take time out of your busy lives and, and really want to, to address this. Whether you're being impacted in some way, or you just want to get involved in help, or you just want to be informed so you can have a conversation with a neighbor. Um, we want to try to facilitate that with a site like this, but more so, what else are we missing, right? And that's just part of this conversation, and that's hopefully the reason why you're here today is you, you want to be part of the conversation, you want to be part of the solution. And um, we want to hear from you. That's that's the way we address it is by working together. So um, we have a. I, I can't. I want to stress this too because Craig's Craig Craig his time out to be here tonight. And with Interfaith, it, we're lucky to have someone like that as a service provider in, in our community. Um, you know, again, it's it's all about helping those individuals and changing their life. And so um, we want to find that avenue to to, to direct them there. And um, so with that, uh, you know, hopefully you're finding this, you know, informative. It starts the conversation. We, you know, we'd like to, you know, continue this conversation and, and, and give you a platform to come and have a conversation with us. Um, and so with that, I, I want to kind of maybe open it up to the group and, and, and hear from you and uh, what brings you out here tonight. Um, you know, if, if you want to share that with us, I would love to hear it. Um, if you just want to sit and listen to others, that's fine too. Don't feel the need like you have to speak, but um, this is your opportunity. Um, and you know, you, hopefully you you signed up. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up, make sure you sign up that form there, um, so we can include you in future meetings and those types of things. So with that, does anyone want to volunteer some? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, in which way are you? So I work for the YMCA Community Support Services. So okay. I'm a social worker president of the YMCA. We work a lot with uh, homeless youth, runaways, LGBTQ youth, and other youth in our community. So I mean, our services are countywide from San Diego all the way to the countryside. So we want to make sure that we're a community partner to not only gain support from the community, but also to be able to support the community. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I start off with a conversation with myself. I'll make sure you have my, my card. And um, one of the things we're looking to do is, is try to get
get a group of the providers together on a regular basis and have this conversation of what resources are out there. Because sometimes we get disconnected a little bit and we have certain you know, community providers, service providers out there doing something and others maybe are not aware of that resource. And so we wanna make sure there's a big awareness and, and that we're collaborating together even as providers, right? Um, we, we've seen, we've started to do this and have these conversations. And I found it interesting that some aren't aware, like there's some county resources at one point and then those county resources, the funding goes away and that happens. And so all of a sudden, like, I don't know what to do now. I have somebody that, that needs some help and I, I don't know where to go. And so by having that group that can come together, we can talk about those resources that are available, especially with the youth too. And we, you know, that's a lot of that's prevention and we're doing some work in that area. Even, you know, Education Compact is doing some work in that area too. Yeah, we do have two drop-in centers um, for, for our youth in our community, one here at Escobedo at the YMCA building. Okay. And then one in the That's great. Yeah, well, that's, we definitely want to get that included up on our site and, and connect that and, and then continue that conversation so we can connect you with other people and everyone's aware of that. Thank you for saying that. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, um, I'm curious how the city measures the impact of all this work, and if you look at the impact as just like less problems, or if there's another measure of positive success. That's a great question. You, you know, um, and there's lots of different ways to kind of respond to that. Uh, if we measure impact in dollars, you can measure it that way. And that's kind of like I was saying, it's really hard to answer that question, how much money we're spending. Um, you can measure an impact on, on economics, right, on businesses. Some businesses are more impacted than others, um, depending on what they're doing on their property and how that might be um, conducive to, their property might be conducive to, to individuals coming and impacting that area. Um, or your neighbors, right? You know, they're not. You're doing the right things, but your neighbors are not, and so it still impacts the area. Uh, so it, it, we talk about the work that Public Works does, and you see some of the data and the, and the maps and some of that. And like Joe talked about, how many tons of, of debris we pick up, and you know, so that has an impact. Um, you know, as a city, we want the city clean. That's part of being safe. That's part of you know, a sense of who we are as a city, right? And so it, it, those things are just, it's, it's difficult to, to just give you like an answer on that and, and, and how do we measure it exactly? I, you know, you can look at calls of service. As the calls of services go up, you know, that's a bigger impact. As they go down, that's it's less of an impact. So it's, it, there's a lot of different ways to kind of measure that and, and kind of answer that. So yeah. I'm not sure it, what particular way you're kind of, you know, your perspective. I guess the simplest we ask how do you know that you're doing a good job? Mm -hmm. So, well, one is visibly, right? You visibly look around. Um, where do we start off this conversation on this main page of our point in time count? We look at that. We look at as our outreach teams um, go around the city and, and we're helping those who are willing to be helped, right? So that's that's a successful, you know, measurement that we're looking for you know if, if a lot of people out there are not accepting services at this point that doesn't mean we're not uns we're being unsuccessful we still need to have those conversations um it's, we need to be there when they're ready to change their mind and so a uh, number of contacts is a way of, of saying are we being successful our outreach teams out there having these conversations and, and and talking to people that's a successful marker for us for sure um, you know, uh, Greg's team at Interfaith, they have some data on how many people they help on a daily basis, provide resources on a daily basis that, all, that gives them the opportunity to have those conversations. How many people that they um, start the housing process that leads to ultimately, hopefully, long-term you know, housing solutions. So we look at those numbers as well. Um, we look at code enforcement and, and, and compliance there. And it's just, we, there's a lot of indicators and, and it's going to fluctuate. For sure, it's going to fluctuate, um, but it's a consistent, you know, thing that we do on a daily basis. And we look. That's why the data is so important. We see something kind of ramping up. We need to we need to adjust and address, right, in the best way that we know how to do. And that's why it's so important that we get that feedback from you and the reported app and making those phone calls and being our eyes and ears. 
So it, it's measurement of, of impact, it, it kind of depends on your perspective and who you are. And some are heavily impacted and some are not. Um, some people and some property owners are doing all the right things and they're still impacted to some degree. And some are not impacted at all. So again, it comes down to perspective. I think that's a, that's a really good question though. I mean, you got me thinking, what, how do you measure impact? You know, and it's different for service providers, to public works, to all the different departments. I know what my impact, I feel I'm making the biggest difference is if I can raise the quality of life of our residents, if, if we can have a, a thriving business community, if we have a lot of people that want to move here and work um, because this, this community is so vibrant and there's so many opportunities and there's less blighted areas in the city. And, and my particular position, just eliminating a graffiti tag um, and, and maybe somebody stops off the freeway for some gas and they go, wow, this is a clean town. I'd like to move here. I'd like to open up a business here. Uh, how, how do we like our community as far as raising young people? Uh, like this cute little girl here. Is, is this a great place for children to thrive? There's so many different impacts that homelessness touches every societal facet that we have. So I really appreciate that question because you got me thinking of all the multiple impacts that this touches. And I think that's why we're all here because every one of us in this room has been impacted or is currently impacted by either declining property values or by less business opportunities or uh, maybe uh, just not being able to get into your favorite store because you're not comfortable going into a certain part of the, the city. So I think at the end of the day, I measure impact on are we increasing or decreasing the quality of life of our 153,000 people each and every day. I like to think we're making just a little bit of impact to, to make it a little bit better for everyone's work and personal life. but. Again, I appreciate that question. I think that could spark a larger discussion. I see we're down our head over here. You feel the same way? Absolutely. Yeah. Just quality of life increasing the, uh, the amount of likability people want to raise children, open up a business, or buy a house here. Anybody else? I'll be shy. Yeah. So I just downloaded your app. I didn't see any data around that. Do you know how many people have it? Do you know, is it working? Um, how many, you know, what is the, the stats on that? Yeah. yeah, we do We do keep track. I don't know the number off the top of my head. It's been in existence for quite a few years. So I, don't, I stopped tracking exactly how many people download it. But what tells me if it's working or not and people are doing stuff is by the number of of um, items that are reported. Um, uh, Jake mentioned yeah. graffiti as, as an example. Yeah. Um, we do, a, by the time we report graffiti uh, uh, during the business week, um, four hours, within an average of four hours, that graffiti is removed. So when you see graffiti around the town, it's just more likely somebody hasn't reported it yet. And we haven't seen it as, as a, you know, as a staff hasn't seen it yet. So. Yeah. So, you, so you're able to really respond to those requests each time. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 we, we do, and, and I don't want to throw our new city manager under the bus, but uh, he has downloaded the reported app on his phone, and um, uh, he witnessed uh, something on the side of the road. He took a picture of it, he reported it, and he was at an event, and while he was at the event, um, uh, city staff went by there and picked that up. So the, the response time with that app is very efficient. Um, it goes right into uh, Public Works Dispatch, and then it's dispatched out to a crew that is near that area or on their function. So it's very, very uh, effective and efficient. Yeah, we have, we have stuff out there that are using cell phones, so as you report something, it pops up on their map, and like, oh, there's something two blocks over here, I'm gonna go take care of that yeah. one. So it's very efficient. They're not having to drive back or someone's not having to contact them. It just, these things just pop up on the phones and they go from one to another to another. Yeah. So. How about the, so that's, this is the first time I've ever heard about the app, by the way. Um, we are new to Escondido though. We've only been here two years, so sorry. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that might be why, but I'm just wondering what are we doing to get that out there? I would love to see everybody, because right. if I'm seeing, what I'm seeing is just not being reported, Wow, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so for instance, in Public Works, we have a staff reported challenge, <laughs> and we average about 1,200 reported a month just from Public Works staff. 
And, and that's not reporting what you're responsible for, that's reporting what somebody else is responsible for. So um, that's like the sweeper operator, um, you know, taking pictures and reporting graffiti. Um, other staff, we, we have an admin staff that walks in our neighborhood um, every night and she's like number two each week on the list of just walking through her neighborhood and, and doing reportings. So I, I think to your point, as a city, we could probably do a better job promoting it. We had a big initial kickoff. We got a lot of people to, to join up, but um, new to the city, you might not have been around for that big initial push. And it's something we could push out on our social media because I'm telling you, once you've used it, it's so easy, it's addictive. You'll be able to get notifications when it's closed. You'll get an update if it got transferred to code versus cops. You get to follow along, and then when you drive by on Wednesday and you see it's gone, it feels really good that you had that impact. So I, I'm glad you downloaded it. Try one on the way home. You'll find something. And you'll be able to follow along with it. And when you see it gone the next day or the <laughs> next couple of days, you're, okay. you're going to feel that impact that you eliminated some blight in the city. And it, imagine if we can have the force multiplier of all 153,000 of us. Right, right. I don't know how we That's can right. handle it all, but we'll figure out a way to do it. <laughs> but I know it's addicting for me. It's gotten to the point where I can't drive by something. I'll, um, I'm glad our police force in here because I make some defensive moves on the <laughs> sidewalk and take a quick picture and, and send it off. But uh, unfortunately, you bring up a good point because our staff leads the city in reports. But we promoted it well with the staff. They get it. We're having challenges and competition and getting cards but our residents uh in large we could do a better job of pushing that out a little more two years in the city you should know about the report of that okay yeah. we try to put like it's on our website at the bottom and that's an actual interactive application so even if you didn't download it you can report it through there on our main uh, public website it has it there as well so we're trying to put it in the path where people might visit the city if they're having some issues or they're seeing some problems hopefully they'll see it that way as well um, <clears throat> you could click right on here and do service requests and start start the whole process, right? Same thing you would do on your phone. But yeah, it, it's we need to find ways. Like we don't know the best way to reach everybody. How do we get in the path of your life? You know, if you're, we try to reach out to certain community groups and let them know about it. Every time we're out and about in these kind of meeting settings like this, we always talk about we always bring it up because. Really, like I said earlier, we can't be everywhere all the time, and so we really rely on you to. So I plan you know, on sharing it on my. I'm, uh, you know, coming kind of, again, new to the city, we joined some groups just to yeah. figure out different like Facebook groups and whatnot, just so that we can um, be in the know about maybe certain Good. things happening and Best whatnot. Best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly food. But you know, you put it out there. The next door, I'm sure yeah. you're familiar on that. Uh, so you guys are okay with links being shared. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Being shared. most definitely. From whatever you want. Yeah. The, cool, the, the coolest thing about it is. I'm going to use graffiti again. Graffiti guys are driving around. There's, on any given day, four or five people driving around a truck. They have a tablet or a phone on it. This is how it works. No joke. You, you fill up, take a picture, and you hit send. It goes to the closest truck. And that guy gets a notification that you sent to him. Didn't go through Joe or Rob or mm -hmm. Jake to dispatch it. Right to that phone. And it goes, he goes right there. And I, I bet you, I challenge anyone to report a tag that doesn't get covered within an hour of us. It's that efficient. I mean, imagine that. Yeah. We, yeah, we don't we don't control their labor. We don't control the routing. They just go to the quickest, fastest, because that's how you get graffiti. You eradicate that as soon as possible. Right. Nobody gets to take over your neighborhood if it's covered over in 20 minutes. So give it a try. I'll be interested to see what you think. I've fallen in love with it, and it's amazing to think that you, you yourself, can report something directly to a truck that's driving around and they'll, you can send them right to your tag or right to your litter request or your pothole. It goes on and on. It's a really, really neat deal. Okay, great. Appreciate that question. Yeah. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Question, and it's probably more of an educational answer. Um, I live in an unincorporated area, and I oftentimes, you know, I'll take my dog up into the rocks and everything, yep. look out over the hills. And I'll, one time I came across um, a mattress and a 12 pack of water. And I thought, well, at least they found a place, safe place to set up, right? So is that an encampment? And why would I want to report that? Really good question. Well, yeah. I, I don't know, Greg, if you want to field this, but uh, <coughs> my initial thing is we want to connect that person with services. We want, to, we want to maybe encourage them not to live in an area like that that's not 
not really suitable. They're out in the weather. It's we really much rather see them, you know, seek out services and, and become housed. Um, so that would be my initial response of why you would want to do that. But then if they don't want that, if they want to just be left alone, now I'm just wearing their home, right? Yeah. See, I'm very conflicted about that. Yeah, that's a t that's a tough one. You can uh, I'm with Interfaith Community Services, and uh, anyone here, I have cards and has my cell phone on it. Um, can you reach out to us and we work with the city to have a homeless outreach team of behavioral health specialists and case managers. The behavioral health specialists are really good at mental health. Case managers, they know where all the resources are and they can get people into housing and shelters and things like that. Um, you can reach out to us, we'll reach out and connect with the individual if it's in a safe location. Um, and uh, most times when you ask somebody if they want shelter, they're gonna say no because- They don't wanna get robbed. They've been on the streets. I mean, so obviously shelter hasn't worked for them. In the past. Right. So you know, we work on building relationships, and we do that in partnership with the city, with public works, with the police department, with other groups. Um, but it's usually a longer, longer process. Um, but yeah, you can reach out to us. We'll, we'll engage, and all of you are here because you care, right? So there are lots of opportunities to volunteer and to get involved personally. Um, also, providing in kind contributions. You know, you can provide a sack lunch to us that uh, you come and make them that can be the part of a sort of a longer conversation about getting into housing or, or, or getting into employment or getting disability benefits if they're not able to work, right? Um, and uh, we, we do a lot of different programs and services and we measure the outcomes of all 78 of them. So if it's housing, we can tell you that last year you helped a little less than 1,500 people move into, into permanent housing. Um, if it's our shelter, we can tell you that about 80% of our shelter residents here in Escondido increase their income while they were in the shelter. So maybe they didn't get into housing, maybe it didn't click, maybe something happened, but but they but they they made some steps forward, right? They've had some stability. It's hard for employee people to get into housing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a challenge, <laughs> right? You know, like interfaith is this idea that we're smarter together, we're smarter with the city, we're smarter with our partners at the YMCA who have really great programs working with youth, right? <laughs> we're we're better together yeah, doing it. So um, so yeah, like all all together. Yeah, it takes a village, right? Um, we could we can do that and um, we, we uh, uh, with the support of the County of San Diego, have purchased a hotel here in Escondido, an old hotel that used to be one of those hotspots for calls to service. Uh, since we took ownership and began operating some short-term housing out of it, the calls to the cops have plummeted. We're moving people out of homelessness into housing. Um, and ultimately, it'll be a place for somebody coming out of a hospital who doesn't have a home to recover in. Um, and we've operated a program like that here in town that has helped really thousands of veterans and civilians over the years. Um, so we have outcomes and statistics we can share with you all if you're interested. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and I'll sit down, is um, we just opened a new family shelter here in Escondido. Um, and the very first family we moved in last week, two parents and a teenage, uh, older teenage kid, and a nine-year-old um, little boy, they were all sleeping in their car. So when we talk about homelessness, these aren't the people who you're going to see in your reported app or creating yeah. any kind of blood. Right. Yeah. These are working parents. Yeah. And the nine-year-old boy had gone to stay with family because what happened last week? School started last week. Mm -hmm. and they wanted to get some rest. So the family let him stay well, so he could get rested so he could get to school. Um, well, he, well, when we got them into the new family shelter, the family could all be together. right? Um, and so that's the first step towards, uh, towards helping that family not just in their homelessness, but you know, get to where they, they, they want to be, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm just glad you all are here tonight and that we're here to come together as a community and work together and uh, appreciate all the, the work that the city's doing too. Thanks, Greg. You know, that got me thinking. Good, good question. You know, we're walking along on a hike. We see trash, debris, a mattress. Um, one thing I'm really proud about the city, don't get me wrong, we've got homeless issues, but I can take you to other cities in North County where you can see 30 tents on the street. We don't see that here in Escondido, although we have our homeless issues. But what, what we've done a good job here is that mattress and trash that sits there, if we allow it to sit there for a week or a month, another mattress shows up. And then the next day a tent will show up. And if you turn your back on it for a month, we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks cleaning up this hillside. Uh, so I think you, you kind of, what Greg hit on is perfect because you have the services aspect, but you also have 
but we've got to clean these areas up because it becomes magnets for other people. And that's what I'm particularly proud of. I can, we can go back and show you where some camps are, but you're not going to see all of Valley Park with 30 and 40 tents. And that's a testament to what Joe's team and Rob's done over the years of allowing the services and offering the services. But if services aren't accepted, you can't just sit in the public right away and camp out, loiter, store your stuff. Um, there's other mechanisms that we have to encourage you to maybe seek services because it can be very hard out on the street. And if, if you're not able to sleep in this corner or cops are moving you along, it, you, we kind of can gently prod you to there's another option for you out there and that's taking a look at services so um, I, I, I appreciate that question if I'm walking along I see a mattress I want another because I know one mattress will be another one and well, then luckily this is not where anyone's ever going to see it you're it's right. like in the valley of rocks yes and it's up by an RV park in North Carolina. okay which is another good question do you guys know that so we're in the city right we've got pockets of county little pockets here, like you look at our city map and it's not a continuous city. No. So we got pockets of county here, then okay, then we've got uh, Caltrans has a big right of way on the 78 and the 15 where you see a lot of the transiency mm -hmm. and Caltrans uh, decided to make a policy decision where they were gonna allow people to stay there for the COVID pandemic. They felt that if they were moved out of those right of ways, they would come into the city mm -hmm. and maybe increase the spread of of COVID-19. So you've got county, you've got Caltrans, you even got North County Transit District has an easement through here um, that provides our mass transportation. And um, and then you have um, private property all around us. So as you go through Escondido, it's not just because your, your zip code might be 92025, doesn't mean you live in Escondido. So we rely on other, uh, other partners. And unfortunately, because we all live in, in Escondido, we don't expect our residents to know, well, am I in North County Transit? Am I in the county? Am I in Caltrans? Am I? No, we want, we, we want to say thank you for reporting that. It's in the county, and we're going to refer that to our partner at the county to go. And get, we don't expect you guys to know everything, uh, who owns what. We want to help and facilitate, get it to the right person to clean it up. Yes, Jake, you have a question? Well, not so much a question. Um, this is a comment. So I do use the report app quite often. Oh, I right. agree. It is quite addicting. It's super <laughs> easy to use. Um, and I have definitely seen, you know, I report something and, you know, it's gone or someone's addressed it. Um, so I, I do appreciate it. Um, and I like just being able to send it and know that. You know, it, it'll get taken care of and someone you know will look at it. Um, so just wanted to say that. And also, um, I do appreciate that we're able to meet um, and start this again. I think it's super important to meet and talk about this issue. It's, it's a big issue and it's a difficult one, um, but I really do appreciate it. Uh, I was formerly with mental health systems and a big portion of our client um, base is homeless and so um, in the city. So um, I really do appreciate this and I hope that we get really good information and data and um, you know some solutions to, to help um, alleviate some of these issues. Really, really glad you brought that up. Um, you bet, give you some props. You, you were the one that bugged me the most to get the this can back up and running. I really appreciate all your emails. Hey, when's the next meeting? When's the next meeting? You got us to do a virtual one, uh, which was quite some time ago. But thanks for your persistence. I agree with what you said. Meet face to face with people that are engaged in the community, you know, service providers, business owners, residents. I think there's tremendous value to that discussion, and I'm really pleased about your report experience. I think that'll just drive a large group to download it and see how it works. I'm in, I can't stop. You think I'm on Facebook? I'm not a reporter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. With all the resources and everything being added to the individual that's homeless, um, the individuals like the sleeping bag, water, food, all these other things that you see on the pictures here, um, at that point it becomes an issue. And if you think of it, to me it seems like it's almost like someone that's like a whole just without a house. It's just a continuance. You know what I mean? I'm not going to let go of this. You know what I mean? 
it has some type of meaning to me, you know what I mean? It comes of value to that individual. Um, at the point though, um, is there a resource that breaks it down to where, you know, um, being the individual knowledge as far as like, hey, you know, maybe living outside in this kind of manner will help you, you know I mean, sustain this kind of help. You know what I mean, as far as just teaching the individual that's homeless, you know, how to uh, provide some type of lighting or outside, uh, you know what I mean, through, you know what I mean, batteries or solar, you know what I mean, little things, instead of, you know, giving all these yeah. different things, like applying some type of education to the individual that says, hey, you know, you don't need all these things like this, you know, to get just this. I mean, if you just work through, you know I mean, um, the solar, you can have all this, you know I mean, from being able to cook to, you know I mean, um, wash or whatnot, you know, like, is there any type of resources going in that direction? Really good question. Yeah, I followed you on that. that you know, you look at a picture like, like this one here and you see all of the clutter. Oh, the yeah, like, so you're dead on, right? I mean, you look, you see tents. Uh, we have people pass out tents, uh, pass out sleeping bags like you alluded to. Yeah. Um, I think working with Greg's folks, I've been told from our outreach professionals, it can take up to 20 times that I have to visit a homeless person before you'll even trust me to Absolutely. offer services. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at with, you know, how can I convince them that there's a better way to live, whether it's solar lighting, whether it's hot water, whether it's, you know, wash clothes, whether it's hygiene, whatever it can be. How do we, you know, why, why store tents and sleeping bags out, right? Why can't we uh, educate them more and accepting a more permanent service that uh, allows them to live a little more, like we're more accustomed. And uh, I think um, what I'd say to that is we have to, we really have to, uh, we've done a good job of reuniting um, a lot of the homelessness that wanted to get back with their families. We're left with what we call the chronic homeless now. The chronic homeless wants to live a lifestyle that you see right here. So your question is, well, how do you get someone who wants to live like that to live more like we do? You know, it, yeah. it's, it's a difficult it, conversation. It, yeah. I'll share with you. I was talking to Greg and some of the other people. I ride along with our public works folks, and we offer outreach to uh, um, the transient population. And I'm here to tell you how difficult it is to have a conversation where you're saying, I can help you get your ID, I can help you get your social security, we have vouchers for housing, or I can get you socks, I can get you a sandwich. And you're talking to a person that either is mentally ill, um, drunk, or on drugs, or all of the above. I mean, I can't even have an intelligent conversation with that <laughs> right now. So it's very difficult for, for us to, to give outreach to a population that isn't even a mental state to absorb what their different options are. So that's the rub we have, uh, is how do we have a conversation where we can get people to to live a different way when they, they're in a state of mind where they're not able to accept that? I don't know, does a group feel like yeah, I just want to say as well, the young ones out of the room. Uh, so people have been traumatized, right? Um, so there was a, there was a, uh, you hit it on the head in one way, Jake, yeah. that, Individuals on the streets, their brains are often functioning differently. But don't don't get confused and think it's all mental health, addiction, personal choice. Um, people have had things happen to them, and their brains they're in a fight or flight mode, and they they're not able to operate in the way that a lot of us are thankfully able to operate. So when it comes to offering somebody help, that's really not the paradigm we we take. We look at it from how are you? How are you doing? What's going on with you? I can, you know, with, where are you at right now? We don't try to just offer and throw things at people because if they, if they get that a lot, it's not going to work. Um, so it's, it, it's tough, though. It takes a lot of time, right? Um, and uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of tough things have happened out there. It's, it's not a safe place to be. So um, all the more important that we do this work. The city is very supportive of funding our outreach teams that are doing this work. Uh, so there's a, a lot of a lot of a lot of work to do, and then even when you make those breakthroughs, there often may not be the housing voucher or the housing resource. So it's a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of good things that happen too when we when we come together. Greg, well, I have. I think would you agree 
when you when you drive around and you see the homelessness on Valley Parkway or Mission and Quince or if you drive around your daily life, Greg and his team and McAllister and all the partners that you've seen, I'm fairly confident that most of the people you're seeing has been offered services many times. Is that fair to say, Greg? Um, Probably, yeah. <laughs> with, with the amount of outreach we do and all the partners that we have, very rarely do I come across someone that says, nobody's doing anything for me. And most of them have said, you know, I have, a, I have an issue with congregate living or I want to live a certain way out on the street. But I really think Interfaith, McCaster, all these groups have done a really good job of canvassing the city. And I feel confident that the ones I, I run into on a daily basis, which uh, we see a lot, uh, always have been offered services or flat out refusing them. And, and my point was that we should understand an offer of service is an offer from somebody, but communication is a two-way street. And if that individual is not in a mental place to be able to process it or think about it or trust the offer, then it really doesn't do much good. And so we really focus on trying to, I, I meet people where they're at, identify what, what is going on in their lives. Why would they choose to live like this? Well, there's some reasons usually. Uh, so we try to help get, get at that. Yep. Yeah. And, and I mentioned point. earlier in the conversation, it's we want to be out there and we want to have these conversations and build a rapport that hopefully will lead down that road of, of changing somebody's life, right? And so we don't want to label everybody. We, we want to be there and we want to continue that conversation. And, and like Jake's saying, our outreach teams, they like, go out and they start this conversation. Sometimes they lead nowhere. But we, we want to get to know who they are. Like, what's your name? You know, it's a simple conversation like that. Even as a business owner, when I talk to some of these business owners, I said, like, how do I deal with some of the homeless that are on my property and I don't really want them to be there because they're impacting my business? And so first start off saying, hi, you know, how are you? Treat them, treat them with dignity. And what's your name? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm you know, I'm so-and-so, you know, uh, you're not one of my customers. And so unfortunately, you're going to have to move along because um, this, you know, this space is for customers and you need to move along. Um, some of the places like, like you're referring to, the mattresses on some of these wilderness areas, if I were to put on my, my fire chief hat, I would be concerned about what they might be doing camping out in those areas. Are they practicing good fire safety hazards? You know, Because even along Caltrans, when we talk to them and we're seeing so many encampments along Caltrans area, start a fire, right? And then where's that going to lead to? So we're, we're concerned about some of those things. And those are, those are the reasons why to kind of report that. But I think it's important, you know, when we talk about why did I go through this website, it's, it's it starts the conversation of there's some information here. This is kind of how we're approaching what you're seeing and, and maybe get some answers to further that conversation and start to deal with some of these things. And hopefully, you know, connecting people to either change their life or it's not illegal to be homeless. And so we need to remember that. But some of their activity is illegal and, and that's going to be dealt with as well. Um, you know, so if, if they're gathering a bunch of things and they're they're toting along. They can they can tote along with their stuff by all means. They, and we look at some of the stuff and like I'd like to help you out, maybe teach you a couple of things. But if they're not if they're not ready for that conversation, but that doesn't mean us, we shouldn't keep trying to have that conversation. So we're you know as a city we're trying to play our role and, and, and we're really looking for for engagement. We're looking for these great service providers that are doing great work out there. Um, you know, hearing about a family being connected and, and changing that and can't imagine a child living like that and having to go through that and going to school and, and like you're saying being traumatized over years of, of having to hide some of that you know maybe there's some guilt built over years you know I, I can't even imagine that and so when we talk about the work we do is very rewarding you know in many many ways it is uh, we're very passionate about what we do and, and the impacts we can have in the city and that's that's what drive all this right and um, so again the website here is as is a resource by no means am I saying that this is the end all be all. Um, there's service providers like like Interfaith has a great site. You can you can go to their site and see a bunch of different things. YMDA has, I'm sure has some great information there as well. Uh, and we'll connect up there. We'll put that on our site too. And we just really want to connect people with information and empower them to do things and and really address whatever drives them. Right? If there's an issue or uh, an impact or you know, how can we make our community better and you know, raise that quality of life, right? Like, like you talked about, and, you know. Um, so the effort is there. The effort is there, and, and you showing up tonight is is your effort, and we appreciate that too. So, 
Yes. You mentioned that um, we're being proactive by reaching out to local businesses that you've identified hotspots mm -hmm. um, and provided resources and so forth. How proactive is the city being in this space and reaching out to local business partners and providing them either with education resources or just a know how of how to deal with um, the homelessness, you know, uh, issue because it, it, it can vary in so many ways. Let it be, you know, referring them to interfaith uh, for services or neighborhood health care, they need health care because um, they may not be well equipped to provide what that individual may or may not need, right? So, your question is how proactive are we being talking to the businesses and dealing with this problem? So, we have two groups right now. Um, we call them geo business groups because we look at an area that's that from our data says this area is being impacted. And um, so we meet with them on uh, every about a month and a half. We meet with them and, and we, we, we go out to their, their properties and we take pictures of some of the problems that are going on in their property. And we have that conversation with each business owner that then collectively as a group, how they can address that particular area and the impacts they're having. That's another reason why we, so beyond that, we, we know that we, that's not addressing all the businesses. And that's why we created this guide right here it's 30 pages long. We try to put everything, anything that we can think of that we talk to all the business owners. And these are the things that you should be considering. So if you're having parking issues, whatever, there's, there's a section on that. If you're having loitering issues and you're out asking someone that you can't be here, you need to move along. Well, by having the signs, then that leads to a conversation with police to come out and address that because you have their proper signage and those types of things. And so we're trying to reach everyone with a guide like this, but then we're also reaching out to certain areas that we know by the, by the phone calls and, and, and the reports and something like that. Calls for service. Calls for service that they are being impacted. So we're trying to be proactive that way. We're trying to reach out to establish these partnerships. And um, and we've seen some success. We've seen some success go in the right way. We've seen also feedback a little bit, right? It, it's a consistent, it's, you have to be consistently working at it. Um, so, and some people are really good at it. Some people are property owners or, you know, they might be owning a, a strip mall and, and and they come and they engage with us and they're doing a fantastic job. And others, the, the property owner is, is vacant and we get the businesses that are just bringing us a spot in, in that in that business uh, complex. And um, so we try to help them too. But it, it's a struggle because it, it does take everybody in a particular area to, to have an impact. And it's how well all of these businesses collaborate together. We had one geo area um, along Washington and Escondido Boulevard that we were having a lot of calls for service in a certain area. We come together, we work with the businesses, and since we did that probably two years ago, I mean, the calls for service have dropped, but the collaboration with all those businesses working together is, is really what um, created the success. All we did from the city was come in, give some advice, give some tools, and, and really that group was the one that's been successful. And our call volume in that area really plummeted after that and it stayed pretty consistent. And like Rob mentioned, our other two other geo areas, um, one of them started out very well and was making great progress, kind of slid back and now we're trying to bring, um, you know, do, do a little bit more work in that area. And then the other area, um, basically we just really kicked it off. We've had two meetings and um, you know, we're hoping to get a lot more participation because just like you folks in here today, you know, it's going to take a whole tribe, um, you know, really to come together and, and, and help with this, you know, with the homeless issue. And so, yeah, it's, it's, we've had a lot of great success with our geo areas. Yeah, if you're, if you're a business owner, you know, business owners and they're struggling, reach out to us, um, let us know. We can look at the area. We can have individual conversations too. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't mind I mean, we'll, we'll come out. Um, so we'll bring, you know, code. We'll bring the cop shit. Um, you know, public works, myself and Rob, and we'll come out and meet with you know your business groups as well. You know, one thing that's hurt us is um, vacant buildings. When you guys go home tonight, you'll notice um, due to the pandemic, it's knocked a lot of our local businesses. I mean, it's it's been awful for them um, and. Vacant businesses are a magnet to people that occupy it and won't be bothered. Also, vacant businesses don't trim their vegetation. They allow their lights to burn up. It becomes a dark area to hide. 
and uh, almost we have a stop uh, our route we 70 spots in the city every day we go around and we check on and I, I bet you 80 percent are vacant businesses they become a magnet to graffiti the broken window theory and that's kind of what we we deal with so i, I think a good idea to report it on my home if you, if you pass some vacant businesses that's where people are going to be betting down tonight <laughs> it's a constant battle that we fight um the homeless population is super smart don't get me wrong uh, when we we get in the morning uh they know public works debris crew starts at 7 30. you see people packing up moving along uh they know on the weekends uh there's not a big presence so you might see a little more of, of homeless activity on the weekends very smart very creative people that uh, i respect tremendously and they have patterns and they know our patterns it's vacant buildings it's weekends um You'll see, maybe uh, you'll see around the first of the month, there's no homelessness around. Well, you know, what happened? A lot of times, uh, that's when the, the checks come and uh, they'll rent a hotel room or, or disappear. And, um, you know, I think that's the main problem that we're facing is a lot of our vacant buildings. Program buildings, active businesses don't attract it as much as the dark, boarded up uh, buildings. And that's a battle we're fighting with the pandemic. We've lost a lot of great local businesses. <laughs> And it's become very friendly to camp out in the, in the doorway in the trash enclosure, and uh, that's a constant battle that is that we're fighting and having to evolve to which businesses are going in. What's, what's being done in the area of uh, like admission and points? <laughs> Jackson, Boston, Star Oaks, Collins, Juniors. Good question. I've been a resident here for 13 years and. You know, I, I have I sympathize with homelessness. Uh, I'm a type of uh, boots on the ground type of person. So I've, I've worked at Interface for years. Um, not worked, but I volunteered at Interface for three years as a, as a chef. I uh, every Thursday cook for the homeless. Uh, and, uh, but it's a problem, you know. And I know, I don't know if that's considered a geo spot because I, I can't imagine the Jack in the Box owner allowing them to be there because I know uh, I stopped going there because uh, I was harassed at one time going through the drive through So has that been targeted by, by your team at all? Yeah, um, that was our first, that was our first pilot of this of this model. And we got a lot of participation from Jack and Box and, and Lowe's was there and, and, and Carmax was there. Come out and, Motel 6, Motel 6 and, and they came out and they we had this conversation on a regular basis and um, there was a bunch of improvements to the Motel 6 property. Um, it butts up against Caltrans, which is not our property. We're not allowed to go on their property and, and do anything about it. So they, the homeless know that that's a safe space for them. So they go on the other side of that fence and they come back. Um, so there's a lot of that kind of activity right there. Um, Lowe's hired a security guard at one point. Fantastic job, and the the area cleaned up real fast. Um, they no longer uh, wanted to, you know, employ a security guard, so they no longer start, had that service, and it just came back real fast. Um, so Jack in the Box is very engaged. Uh, they come to all of our meetings. They, I, I drive through that parking lot and I see their improvements they're doing on their property. Um, to me today, that that property is much better, but. They're a little bit of a victim of their surrounding businesses. On the other side of the canal, you have the Denny's and you have a couple of businesses back there. There's a security guard that, that walks that, that whole property and you don't see any issues over there. So um, it's just a matter of property owners being engaged in doing some of the things that they need to do to take care of the property. Um, CarMax, for example, no, no real issues there. Even behind them on the Caltrans side, there's no issues there. It's really primarily behind the loads. The lighting back there, is, is could use some work. I don't know if you've driven by Carmax at night. That place is pretty lit up, right? <laughs> um, and, and so lighting plays a big role in that. You know, um, people want to bed down for the night in, in darkness and, and and those types of things, and they don't want to be spotted, so they, they kind of shy away from such things. So when we talk about property owners and doing some things, there's some things that they can do on their properties to, to kind of make their property maybe not a target, make their areas not necessarily a target. You know, we're not really going after homelessness, but if you're being impacted, there's some things you can do to kind of mitigate that. And so we really try to engage with them, but at the end of the day, it's their property. So if if they are doing something that causes a, a code issue, code compliance, we'll have to have a conversation with them as well. 
And, and that's where my folks would step in and we would come out and get a step 10 evaluation. So that's crime prevention through environmental design. And that's what we did for CarMax. And CarMax took that recommendation and replaced all their LPS lights with LED lights and then really um, secured their lot. Um, that same evaluation was done with the other businesses. And, and like Rob mentioned, some went with it and some did not. And, you know, really the security guard presence was really what, what, what really helped um, Lowe's out. And then when the security guard went away, that's kind of when he regressed a little bit. So my, my problem with this is I struggle with the big box stores joining up to this partnership. Uh, CarMax excluded them. They've been great. But Lowe's, Albertsons, Home Depot, the, the big box corporate managed back in New York, I struggle to get them to the table. But Jack in the Box, Liberty Barbershop, <laughs> show up. A, a small, uh, you know, locally owned business, they're very engaged and want mm -hmm. to show up. But it's it's kind of hard to, to get to the right person because locally they don't have, like, there's no real ownership in, in the Home Depot on East Valley Parkway. There's a manager there, they're staffing, they're loading trucks. They don't really, it's hard to get them engaged in the 30,000 foot view. It, it's several layers up that you've got to go into that corporation to finally, and that's where it, from code compliance, when, when you write a citation that you're allowing trash and debris to accumulate, then that does make it up the chain of command because they're going to have to cut a check eventually and you do get their, um, their attention. <laughs> so it's kind of pulling the right lever to get the right people to the, uh, to the table. But I think one of the things you might have noticed if you go by the channel on uh, Quince, right across where Continental Cleaners is, All Star Glass, uh, Public Works moved the, the channel gates up to the sidewalk. Before it created a three sided kind of room right behind Carl's Jr., you probably walk by it to go to Jack in the Box. Uh, moving those gates up to the sidewalk eliminated spaces for people to hang their laundry and to accumulate debris that ends up in your channel, that ends up down in Harmony Grove and out, uh, out to the ocean. So. Those little tweaks, those problems. Uh, but I talked to the Continental Cleaner guy just the other day. He says, I'd like to I'd like to have these conversations with the transients. But I'm afraid if I do, they're going to throw a rock through my window uh, mm -hmm. at night. Uh, I'm afraid they're going to tag or graffiti or get into a confrontation. And that's where we kind of walk the fine line where we do want to, as a business owner, encourage you to say, hey, my name's Jake. How are you doing? Is there anything I can do to help you? Yeah, I want, uh, I want some food. Well, great. If they should search Rex from 8.30 to 9.30, you can have them down there. If they don't move, then to say, hey, we've, we've, I've had this conversation with you. I really need you to move along as for paying customers. And you get to where you don't want that confrontation. How far do you go? How far do you talk to somebody that could be suffering from mental illness? It could be up or down or, or could be on a, a controlled substance. So it's, it's a fine line. We're trying to coach the businesses to take control of your business, take ownership in that. Check your lighting, check your vegetation, your signage. Can we even can we even cite people in your parking lot? Because do you have uh, signs that are required to do that? And just educating businesses to make it unattractive to be homeless here. Program businesses that have well-maintained vegetation, that have great lighting, that have security guards, do not suffer from this problem. And the people that don't get on board with that end up getting it because they come a more desirable place to, to be. So we could talk today about this corner because I've, I've spent a lot of time out there and it's kind of a, a given day. Go ahead now. Uh, regarding that corner, um, the earlier uh, one you described the difference between the chronic homeless and then the other homeless where life happens and you know, they're trying to recover. Are the chronic homeless as dangerous and threatening as everyone assumes they are? Wow. Because I see that comment and it just it infuriates me. It's like, how can you assume that just because they're homeless they're chronic? And they're going yeah, to yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a tough thing. And I, I mentioned already once before is you don't want to label everyone across the board. You, you really need to get to know them a little bit and, and be willing to do that. I'm not saying go out there and seek them out and have conversations with them by any means. But if someone is in your area, you know, that's why the call for services, you know, you can have a social or have this conversation. They can turn around and let you know this person is not a dangerous person, this person's okay, or those types of things. If somebody is dangerous, we, we want to have those conversations. We want to figure that out. But we do want to treat people with dignity. We do want to treat people with respect, and we, we want to do the right things. And and it shouldn't vary you a little bit. Just like we shouldn't label everybody in this room, right? Um, and so we want to be careful with that. So keep encouraging people not to do that. But 
people. But at the same time, I don't want to be encouraging something that might be false, right? So yeah. in that event, in that situation, like the corner he's talking about, I've, heard, I've seen a number of people on Facebook say, I won't even go to that whole area. I won't go to Lowe's, I won't go to Jack in the Box, I won't go anywhere near there because all the homeless are hanging out there. You, you know, and, and that's the way you drive some change, right? Um, we want to have businesses that are investing in our community, not just here to make a dollar, right? They need to be participants in our community. They need to care about these things. They start to lose some business, that starts to speak to them and starts to say, you need to do something about that. We continue to have those conversations as well. We, If someone sends us a message and says, like what you're saying about Lowe's, I won't go shop there anymore again. We let know, we, we, we don't pass along your information or anything like that that somebody says, but we say, we're getting emails talking about people are gonna choose, they're starting to choose not to visit your establishment. This is gonna start impacting your business. You really need to take this stuff seriously. So we use that information as you guys are eyes and ears out there and you convey that to us as a tool to start that conversation with them and hopefully part of them and change what they're doing. One way or the other though, if they're, if they're not in compliance, we will deal with that too. You know, what I see, I'll, I'll pull one second. What I see is what Greg touched on. The homeless I do outreach on are their most vulnerable and traumatic, they're shattered people. And if you walk up to them and say, hey, dude, you need to move along, get on out of here, you're peace there, they're gonna react back that way three times harder. Mm -hmm. So it's that delivery of the message. It's that treating people with dignity. Like you said, my name is Jake. What's yours? Hey, how you doing? Um, just want to let you know, is there anything I can do for you? I mean, uh, can I get you help or anything? It's it's the delivery of that message when someone's at rock bottom vulnerable. If you treat them poorly, you're going to get treated poorer by them on multiple five. So it's it's that initial way you speak to them. If you treat them with respect, they're the, the greatest people. I mean, they would love to help you out on that. That's what I thought works for me. Go ahead. Yeah, I was um, working for the staffing company a while back, and uh, for the 4th of July, downtown San Diego, and um, it was, I went with a crew from up here, and they were kind of young, in their 20s, and uh, we were working with the police and everything at the trolley. And what I noticed on, I say because the transparency part, um, being young, you know, and you see it through their, their vibe and everything that they had a rough upbringing kind of thing. And uh, they took off for quite some time and everything. And the officer came up to me and was like, hey, where are they at? And it's, I don't know, you know what I mean? But, it's like that attitude right there, y'all. You don't even take appreciation to see that, you know, at least they're not out there doing the graffiti. At least that they're not out there, I mean, breaking someone's rocks or whatnot. You know what I mean? They're, they're here trying to. You know I mean? that, that, that part right there took like no awareness to, to the officer, and it was like, well, they should be here doing their job. And it's like, yeah, that's true. If, you know, if one had the upbringing, how you had it, but being not, being on reality that hurt people, hurt other people, you know, I mean, I believe honestly with, you know, I mean, the money that some of the individuals are receiving right now, when that comes to an end, this is becoming yep. even worse. Mm -hmm. So it's on the concept of, you know, I mean, all of it's my way or the highway kind of attitude, so it's not going to do us no yep. And you're absolutely right. It's going to be three times harder because of that attitude of, you know, mean, it has to be seen this way. This is the world. You know, it, to prosper in life is, you know, I mean, yeah, this is the past. You know, I mean, you got to visualize that how can we bring this into the education part? How can we, I mean, bring this more into the business part. I mean, how can we start to develop off of what we're seeing in front of our face here? You know what I mean? Ooh, this year. You know, how can we build our one nation like this year? You know I mean? I totally agree. I mean, traditional methods aren't working with no. what you're saying. It, it's not, it, we have to think out of the box. And mm -hmm. it's hearing stuff like what you just said and, and with the rest of the group that spurs that thinking to, to know traditional methods you know, it was all, you know, housing first, and we got to do this, and, and no, it's time to think uh, outside of that, the changing times. I appreciate our 
youth trying to work. And yeah. maybe you're not doing it at 100%, but I, get, I cut you a break for uh, signing up for the security and going down there and, and trying to be part of the solution to get out on the streets for the around. Totally agree. And, and that's one of the reasons why we work with so many of, of our local and regional service providers, because every provider provides maybe something a little bit different to where, you, you know, what, what's being offered at one, you know, may not be offered at another, you know, whether it's youth, you know, with YMCA compact, you know, whether it's women, if it's children, whatever it is, that's why we work with a broad range of service providers. So we could try, um, our, our cops unit um, rides with a, with a per clinician and that per clinician will diagnose, you know, a certain type or an individual. And then, then she will recommend on where, you know, this you know, person needs to go. So you're right. I mean, that's the reason why we're here today. That's the reason why we work with so many of our, you know, local and regional service providers is to try, you know, to get a whole gamut of solutions together. Because just like what uh, what Greg mentioned, you know, there, there's a, it's, it's a very complex situation. Yeah. You have the, you know, soon to be homeless, you know, you know, the people that are, you know, one paycheck away from being homeless, all the way down to, you know, the substance abuse, mentally ill, post, you know, traumatic stress, you know, life-changing event, you know, all the way down, you know, to, to that aspect of it. And, you know, we're not the professionals, you know, these folks are the professionals. And that's why we partner with um, a lot of our partners. Really good discussion, ma'am. You have one more. I was curious if you guys have any information on other states and counties that have the, uh, they've implemented solutions, I don't know if they're effective, um, tiny house communities. <laughs> yes. How, yeah, how we, are those doing? So it's funny to bring that up. When our, our first community advisory groups boiled all of these three good ideas down to micro cabins or sleeping cabins. Mm -hmm and a day center in the city. And uh, really good ideas still have momentum, still going forward. Um, because of that, we excluded a lot of these other topics that people are bringing up, so we broadened it. But those two ideas are still alive and kicking and, and being discussed around uh, in future funding and future budgets to be options for the city. On the recycling part? Yeah. With minimum wage going up and everything, does the recycling currency of the value of recycling go up as well, or is that not? Good, good question. Yeah, yeah, the recycling commodity market has created. Yeah. It has evaporated. Um, several years ago, no, probably two, three years ago, China stopped taking, uh, which was our number one uh, consumer yeah. of raw materials, and it, it, they required to be almost 100% pure or they set it back. So there still are strong metal markets um, uh, that you can sell catalytic converters and wiring to. But uh, for um, recycling and large, um, we have a great partner, Edo EDI in town, does a great job. I mean, we, we have this phenomenal asset in an anaerobic digester just down the street that no other city has. We're able to recycle food waste, which is really the only market get this out of landfills because paper, plastic, glass, aluminum has just evaporated. So we're fortunate enough to have EDI and have these two big stomachs over there that break down all of our food waste. And you're going to hear a lot about uh, recycling your food waste coming up in the next couple of years. A way to offset all the recycling that's going into your landfill, we're going to, we're going to do that by diverting food waste and composting into that. So uh, if I answer your question, I don't know. But not quite. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that with the big companies, Bond, Strauss, yeah. Albertsons, um, them not wanting to deal with the homelessness and everything have cut their recycling part to just, you mean, there's the recycling center. And I know oh, yeah, yeah. the city uh, voting and everything that, you know, as long as there's a recycling center within uh, this year, uh, it's, it's okay for this business not to have that to be, um, you know, even though I'm dissing it all out, I'm not willing to take any of it back in. Like, they fall in the coding of that. Um, the question 
know what is um, for the marketing part to bring I mean, our value up as a community does since the homeless do a lot of recycling, why is it still at five cents or yeah. ten cents? Yeah. Does it not go up with the minimum wage or how does that? Did everybody remember we used to go to Albertsons and Bonds? and they'd have a, like a 40-yard container and it was like a recycling yeah. center. Do you remember yeah. those? Yeah. They were all over. I think oh, we had several thousand. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. No yeah. more. Thank you. Part of the same problem that we had with the recycling market is why those all failed. Because there wasn't any money in the commodity to reimburse your five cents. So we saw massive amounts of the state of California removed. Um, and it was... Oh man, it, we spent months and months trying to get them because they were closed down and there was light on the city to get the state to move those away. And it took a long time, but it is due to the fact that the state can't pay your five cents California redemption anymore. The commodity is not worth it, and they're not in the business to losing money. So the state decides that somebody's going away, and here we don't have those, those centers anymore. I want to be respectful of our time. We're, we're a little bit past our time, um, and so I want to make sure that I get you guys out of here on time. I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate your involvement, your engagement for being here tonight. Um, you know, as we continue to have these conversations, please encourage others to join us. Um, check out our website, the reported app. Um, if, if you want to further the conversation in an individual way, uh, reach out and let us know. Um, you know, we definitely. I want to connect with other providers and get some of that information and, and further those conversations and make sure we reach as many people as we can. So, um, John, any final words? Thank you for coming out tonight.